educational portion of our program. And remember, uh, anytime you have a question, you know you wanted it, uh, to have it answered, uh, just type it into the Q&A, that way you know we'll get to it. Uh, so go ahead, uh, all yours, David. Thanks, Scott, and hello, everybody. Always nice to be here. Um, I do start off a little topic. Of course, you can ask questions about anything, um, but I want to talk about just briefly tonight, something we've talked about in the past, but I think it's important to revisit, and that's the whole idea of when we get into recovery, move past our addiction, the idea of freedom. And I think the, the freedom that that action brings um, in, in so many different ways. And it, of course, there's freedom from the addiction, but it, it goes so far beyond that. I just kind of wanted to talk about that a little bit. And I think, you know, recovery doesn't just mean freedom, of course, it means hope and possibility and, and a lot of kind of positive things that, that we, can, we can do. But I think when we think about freedom in recovery and from addiction, I think of that freedom is no longer stuck in that same cycle of addiction. And I think addiction, if, if anything, is this incredibly um, persistent and, and after boring um, kind of horrendous cycle that, that you really do get trapped in. And, and there's, it seems there's no way out. And we see the different phases coming, we know it's coming, we know, but, but it's almost impossible to get off that, that merry-go-round. And, and that brings sadness and despair and hopelessness and confusion and all these negative things. I think we get caught up in that. I think recovery really means, at least for me, it was the first time to kind of break out of that and to, to get out of that cycle and, and some of that, what became kind of normal emotions in my life of just in sadness and despair and mostly hopelessness. Because I, I would try, like every addict, try to break those cycles and, and have a lot of difficulty doing it. So, the, so those futile attempts to heal, the, the attempts, the failures, the feel even worse about myself, the shame about it. So the freedom from, from all that. Um, freedom to find positive emotions. You know, I, re I realized there, there was excitement in my addiction. There was for a while some excitement, I guess, some intensity, but ultimately the, the feeling kind of palette of emotions were, were really negative and uncomfortable. There was sadness and despair and hopelessness and shame and, and remorse. And so for me, recovery meant the freedom to, to experience other kinds of emotions, um, joy. And I mean, like real sustainable joy, right? The things that, that will last, um, happiness. I didn't know what happiness was. I didn't know what really positive feelings were. In fact, like most addicts in early recovery, I had to kind of, it was like learning a new language. Like what is this feeling I'm feeling? Because it was a new, a new sensation, especially when, when my body started to wake up and I was able to connect a name with an emotion and with a feeling in my body instead of a, sort of connect those two. Um, for me, it, it meant finding purpose. You know, I, my life totally was transformed in every way from recovery, not just saving my life from addiction, but, but like many people, I got interested in, in the field and I changed careers and I went back to school and I did other things and I started writing and started training and being a therapist and just this whole new world opened up that I didn't have before. And so for me, it was finding meaning, meaning and purpose because before my life was, felt just kind of like spinning and spinning without much meaning or direction. And I think it was really the, the freedom to make choices, the freedom to follow my face and fail, but also the freedom to have those choices to move forward and, and find something where I felt I was making a contribution. So that was really important to me. Um, freedom from a limited belief system. You know, what I found is that my, my logic and my brain and my world got, got very small. So, for me, things by, by limited belief systems, I mean black and white thinking or overgeneralizing or catastrophizing or these kind of simplistic um, frames that I interpreted the world through that were not very helpful and, and giving me false choices and giving me um, the wrong data, the wrong conclusions. So just really learning to identify my thinking patterns and being able to break out of those um, and those belief systems in a way that um, everything wasn't generalized, everything wasn't catastrophic, you know, it was all much more balanced. Um, freedom from those dysfunctional beliefs about myself. You know, I think, and these were things that were there long before I ever picked up at a drink or a drug or, or any kind of acting out behavior that I was, I learned those early on as a kid, like most of us, you know, so that beliefs like, um, I'm not enough, or I'm unlovable or I'm hopeless, or I'm all alone, or I'm doomed. You know, all of that stuff that we internalize as a result of unfortunate experiences. 
for the first time, I was able to, first of all, be taught that that was the world I was kind of soaking in. I didn't even realize it, but I kind of broke out of that and, and learned other ways of thinking about myself and, and recovery and possibility. And, and that was done not only through therapy, but through the reflection of people in, in recovery groups that, that gave that back to me. And then finally, I think freedom from not being defined by my past. You know, I think um, my story, like all of us, I think we write a story about ourselves and mine was, you know, about trauma and loss and victimhood and addiction and missed opportunities. And, and I had the freedom to kind of change my story in recovery and rewrite it and rewrite the ending and really kind of change who I was. And um, I found the addict's story to be too limiting and, and, and an unhappy one. And I, I, that's not the one I decided to choose. And, and I'm gonna close with just one thought. I, I like um, Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. Scott knows I've done a couple of lectures around it, but the Hero's Journey is this universal myth um, that almost every culture in the world has. And it talks about sort of a normal person who faces some ultimate test or challenge, often life-threatening, and falls into this dark kind of underworld and me is, is kind of tricked and has struggles and overcomes people and meets mentors and guides and gets help and, and gradually reemerges from this kind of underworld um, as a hero. Okay? When in a normal person emerges as a hero, but he's a hero to himself and to, to the community. The, the purpose of the, being a hero is to, to pay it forward, to move it on, to do service. And, I, and to me, that just perfectly captures at least my own experience with, with recovery where you know, yeah, there were challenges. It was dark. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but but coming out of it, um, I was a changed person. And I think that for the better. And I think that um, that kind of just sums it up. So for me, freedom um, and recovery go hand in hand. And as I say, it's the freedom to mess things up, but it's also the freedom to choose I, in a way that I never had when I was in my addiction. So thank you. Uh, thank you, David. For those of us, uh, for those of you who are joining us a little bit late, um, the topic uh, this week um, that David covered um, equates recovery with freedom, and uh, it's a great topic. Ask us questions in the Q and A or the chat feature, but preferably the Q and A. Uh, we've got some in there already, and we'll get to them soon. But I, I really like this topic. Um, you know, um, people sometimes will say, "What's the best thing about recovery?" and and I say, "I have choices." Um, you know. Every moment of every day, I have a choice. And when I was in my addiction, I, I didn't have any choices. I mean, it was the day was laid out, and it wasn't a pretty day. And it, but it was laid out, and I didn't have any choices. Um, you know, a, another analogy I use is, you know, I say the road narrows because you know, my things we do in recovery, um, things we did in our addiction that were completely acceptable are not acceptable. In, in recovery, so the road narrows, but it leads a whole bunch of more places and better places. Um, I have, you know, again, it's choices. You know, I can go this way or that way or that way, and all of those places are way better than than where I was going before. And the addiction um, road is kind yeah. of circular. It goes in circles. Yeah, circle. yeah um, and yeah. and you know, I was actually about to because um, have you ever seen the movie Pleasantville? Yeah, this is a, literally one of my favorite movies. And and for those of you who don't know. Um, it's a kid who's a fan of like a 50s Leave it to Beaver kind of sitcom. And he gets a magic uh, TV remote and gets sucked into the TV along with his sister, who is like very different from him. And she's kind of a party girl. And um, they get sucked into this TV sitcom. And, and literally, the road in Pleasantville goes in a circle. Like, you know, there is nothing outside of Pleasantville because it's a TV show and it's in black and white. And it's very 50s and it's very regimented and, um, you know, but it's kind of the, the kid's sister who introduces, you know, things like, oh, when you go to Lover's Lane, you do more than hold hands. Um, so people start bursting into color in this town and then it becomes a racial analogy, which is not so relevant to our discussion here. But, but the, as everybody's eyes gets, get opened and they see the world through different eyes and and, and they realize the beauty that's out there. And for me, and, and roads start actually leading out of Pleasantville. They start to have choices. They see colors, they see beauty. Um, they have a choice to succeed or fail. You know, 
they're they're freed from their limited beliefs. Everything David just talked about, I, I think it's just Pleasantville is a perfect analogy for addiction recovery. I love this movie. I highly recommend it. Um, and watch it with your addiction in mind if, if you do. Um, but yeah, um, I, and and even when you said you know the road of addiction is a circle, it is the road around Pleasantville is a circle yes. until they open it up. Um, oh, I got to look at it again. I haven't seen it in a long time. Yeah, I kind of love that movie. It's permanently on my DVR. It's like a comfort movie if I'm having a bad day. I can still watch Pleasantville. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, they get to write their own story. You talked about writing your own story and deciding how it ends. And that's kind of what happens to all of the characters at the end of the movie is they all realize, oh, you know, the, the script people are not writing my story anymore. I get to be who I want to be. Um, and it's really exciting. Um, anyway, I cry every time. All right, enough. <laughs> so, what? Yeah, okay. what Let's get into the Q&A here. Um, type your questions in the Q&A. We'll get to as many as we can by the end of the hour. Um, <coughs> the first one here says, are two of the mo most important aspects of self-esteem, making choices I can live with and changing my self-talk to something more rational and kind? Uh, thanks always for this. I look forward to hearing you every week. You're very welcome. Um, great question. Yeah, thanks. And boy, self-esteem is such a huge topic because, you know, relevant to what we we're speaking of just now, the when we get trapped um, in our addiction or with, with someone who's struggling with addiction, that it impacts our self-concept and our self-esteem and our self-worth. And that usually echoes with those old core beliefs we were speaking about of, of not being enough or something's wrong with us. And just the whole thing kind of bounces around and really causes a big problem. So the focus of, of improving self-esteem or self-worth is, is really huge. And so um, I think, you know, when you say making choices I can live with, I guess I'm thinking um, that for me, I, I started framing that through boundaries, maybe good boundaries, but good choices in terms of um, living with integrity, living with realistic choices, I think. And really that has so many different connotations because uh, one of the mistakes I think people make often in early recovery, especially is over committing, you know, doing these gigantic recovery plans with way too many commitments to meetings and activities and calls. And, and that just appeals kind of to my addictive personality because when I do that for three or four days, then I get overwhelmed and I quit. You know, so I think we need to really find balance. So in, in that sense, I think healthy choices and then, and then having successes builds that self-esteem. Um, choices about who we associate with, who we uh, feel we deserve, what we feel deserve in our lives. So yeah, there's a lot of that. I think that that goes into healthy choices. For me, honestly, in early recovery, I needed some kind of help. I need some guidance with healthy choices. I wasn't quite sure what those were. And so for me, I needed some reflection from my peers and, and guidance in that. But, but I think um, that's certainly one. And then, you know, you hit on one of my personal favorites, which is that whole self-talk business. You know, self-talk is, is that kind of internal, usually critical voice that we all have that you know, chatters in here, undermining and sabotaging and criticizing. And, you know, sometimes we can identify the voice as our mother or our father or somebody. Sometimes it's just anonymous voice, but, but um, it's a constant companion. And I think one of the main tasks early on is to just, first of all, separate ourselves from it because it's so constant, it becomes kind of part of our head. And I think we have to kind of differentiate us from that critical voice and then really start to change that because that's just a reflection of who we're not. You know, those are old beliefs. Those are old, those limiting beliefs I spoke of, they, they just keep us trapped. And I think um, really correcting that self-talk is important and having the willingness to do it, you know, and sometimes, when we talk about say affirmations, which are more the positive reverse of some of that, um, they're, they, they're hard for people to do because it's, it seems unnatural. It seems um, not realistic. And I think we have to really kind of practice until it does start to feel more like us. Um, we had a discussion in a group today about people receiving positive feedback. And you know, if, if we can take it and, and people can give it to us, but if it doesn't match how we feel about ourselves on the inside, it's gonna kind of ring untrue and it's gonna be harder to accept. And so we really have to work on, on the inside beliefs about ourselves. And those do change in recovery. That's the exciting thing to see that, to see that change with some work, especially if people will have old trauma that starts to get resolved. A lot of those really false messages that people pick up early on start to get corrected. 
So I think those are two aspects that I think are, are very um, important. I think you talk about self-talk being rational and kind. Boy, that is not classic self-talk. That's beautiful self-talk. And so, yes. And I think, and I would extend that kindness and compassion, self-compassion to all aspects of ourselves, right? We are, um, it's so typical to drop into shame, to drop into criticism, to feel like just bad people, you know, all that negative stuff. And not that addicts don't have to take responsibility for what they've done, they absolutely do. But I think it's important to separate some of those acts from the core person, the core person we were maybe before we got addicted. So yeah, I think all those things are tremendously important. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, I was gonna add um, in AA, um, when I first got there, um, they, they sort of, said, you know, if you want to, if you want to have self-esteem, behave in esteemable ways. And what they meant was stop behaving like an asshole. Um, <laughs> you know, stop behaving like you're a horrible person. And, and I actually do think that's part of building self-esteem is stopping being a jerk. And, and, you know, another AA saying is bring the body and the mind will follow. So that, you know, that would, that involved things like just showing up at meetings and opening my mouth and sharing and, and sharing without like horrible shame and being of service, you know, making coffee, emptying the ashtrays, um, you know, putting the chairs up at the end of the meeting, um, just little things and not expecting any any thanks, um, just behaving like a human being who cares about other human beings. And for me, that actually, with all of the stuff that David just talked about, this kind of helped reinforce that, um, you know, just behaving as if. I was a good person, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, you hear this, the, the phrase, what would Jesus do? I mean, it, you know, for me, it was what would somebody who's been in AA for a while do, um, or, or, or my other 12-step programs, what would they do uh, in this situation and try to behave the way they would behave? And it really helped me when I changed my behavior, it helped my self-esteem, um, but I also had needed better self-talk and, and, and better choices and um, to be around, quite frankly, nurturing, empathetic people, which I hadn't been in my active addiction. Um, you know, Scott, that brings up an interesting point, just to, you know, sort of one of those chicken or the egg discussions, right, which comes first? And I think the action has to come first. Um, it's certainly did with me too. Um, I started to work on the inside, but I, I didn't want to wait until those beliefs changed because they took a long time. And I think they were it was essential to start acting differently before those beliefs could change. So I think the action has to come first, at least in my case. Yeah, I mean, chicken, egg, who cares? It, it all needs to happen, <laughs> you know? But for me, um, I, I had to change my behavior before the, before the mind caught up. And, and then after the mind caught up, then the heart had to catch up, um, you know, for me to really believe. <laughs> so it was a process, um, so. Um, wife of a sex addict. Um, it's been one year since disclosure, um, 18 months since discovery. Um, so it sounds like there's been a formal therapeutic disclosure a year ago. Um, the sex addict did not, would not engage in recovery work, just kind of as a CSAT, goes to four to five 12 step meetings a week, but is still in denial, not humble, not able or willing to see and feel what damage she has caused our 30 year marriage. Uh, in Sounds like uh, the wife here is in treatment now and she's anxious and worried about the future. I've always wanted it to work. I'm thinking I need to stand my ground and file for legal separation to show I'm serious. Um, you have six months. Um, I think I need to take a stand even though it scares me. Is that the right approach? She says all the right things but hasn't followed through. Yeah. Sorry yeah. for the situation, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's, a, it's one of those kind of painful situations where things, kind of the main structures are in place, but it sounds like it's not um, being worked with all the maybe seriousness that it might be. You know, disclosure is an important event. Um, 18 months is a long time. Uh, even four to five meetings a week is quite a bit, but I think we can go through the motions, but if we're not engaged, um, that's, that's a real problem. And um, when I see things like um, a lack of humility or aspects of denial or unable to kind of 
have empathy or, or see things from a different perspective, um, that, that's concerning to me. Because after 18 months of good recovery, I would expect a lot of that to have changed, if not all of it. And so, yeah, I think that there's something that needs to be done because you, you could easily slip into kind of a status quo. Um, so I think it's, I hope, um, with your support ser services, whether it's a therapist or whoever that is, I really encourage you to talk about what kind of boundaries do you need to set? Because I think some kind of action needs to be taken. Um, uh, trial separation might be something, legal separation, there's, there's different options. Um, I think the important thing here is that whatever option you choose, you need to be able to follow through. Um, and so you really wanna think it through clearly, get the support you need, get your ducks in a row and be, be ready and willing to, to follow through if need be. Hopefully that you won't, but, but you might. And it might be that follow through that actually um, saves the marriage ultimately if, if that person wakes up. So yeah, I mean, it sounds like you guys have kind of, despite the, the, the activity and the motion have dropped into this kind of static uh, place of without recovery really progressing. So I think, yeah, some kind of boundary or um, uh, statement is probably gonna be useful. Here, yeah. I've been coughing today, so I'm muting myself. Um, I'm glad you're in treatment because you have, a, it sounds like you have a therapist that you can really talk about the boundaries with and, and figure out how to set them. Um, I do want to point out, you know, we can be at Seeking Integrity, Seeking Integrity, we can be really Pollyanna sometimes. Like if you do the work and, you know, you're going to be a much better person at the other end when you come out of the tunnel and your relationship's going to be much better off. And sometimes, you know, people go through the motions and don't do the work, or sometimes they even do the work, but it just turns out they're not that great of a human being. Um, and <laughs> we find out, oh, this is a really flawed person. And their partner has to decide, you know, okay, well, you know, before I was blaming it on the addiction, but now I see that, you know, maybe he's just really flawed too, and I'm not sure I want to stick with this or not, or um, I mean, it doesn't always work out the way we would like. I think it always works out um, if we work our recoveries, um, either individually or, or as a couple things work out for the better, but it's maybe not always the way we wanted it to work out in the beginning. Um, did that make sense? I, I don't want to yeah. overstay. I don't want to be, you know, the opposite of Pollyanna, whatever that is, but, you know. No, I think just being realistic about it, but I think, um, I think everybody can recover, and I don't think that's Pollyannish. I think that's a fact, but but it takes that application. And there, the big book talks about some people that are constitutionally incapable of it. You know, that small minority. So I mean, that's that's out there. But I think um, I would certainly try this first. <laughs> try try to oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Set down a, you know a, a boundary and and see if you can make it work. Thirty years is a long time. And that's a long big chunk yeah. of both of your lives. And I think yeah, if you've been together 30 years, I'm going to assume, and I think rather safely, that there's a lot of good stuff about your marriage and your connection with each other. Otherwise, you wouldn't still be together after 30 years, yeah. Um, yeah. plus a year and a half of, you know, since D-Day. Um, there's got to be something worth saving here. So, yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> um, the subject of trauma comes up a lot in recovery. Uh, could you both discuss as much as you're comfortable some of the trauma in your own histories? Um, it's very helpful to hear the traumas of actual therapists in the addiction field. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Uh, yeah, so uh, trauma, I think, first of all, underlies probably most addiction, if not all addiction. I always hesitate to say all, but I, I believe it probably is all. Um, and does come up, and I think it's universal, and certainly, you know, I experienced it in several forms. One um, was the loss of a sibling, unexpected, you know, death of a sibling when I was four, and just that, for me, that just hijacked my family's attention. My parents got totally distracted and diverted and depressed, and my sister and I were kind of left behind, and, and there was nobody there because they were all totally into their own grief and, and, and that, and there was other things. There was addiction and alcoholism in the family. There was uh, neglect, and we talk about neglect, I mean, emotional neglect, really, my parents not being emotionally connected. Um, a lot of bullying, I mean, which we also know is a chronic 
low grade trauma. So compared to some traumas that I deal with with my clients, I mean, just really more devast, much more devastating than that. But but trauma is personal, and that was my trauma, and um, and it really did steer much of my self concept and my life, and uh, stayed the same uh, even into early recovery until I got some trauma therapy. I think that's the key here: is that trauma therapy, specifically designed for trauma, meaning it has a component that is not only cognitive but also somatic or body, because uh, trauma is in both places. Uh, that was really important for me, and I've done it several times in my life. Um, as other events, uh, I'll tell you later uh, in the 80s, I was a young gay man in New York City when the AIDS crisis hit and went through that. I was newly sober. Uh, four out of five people in my A meetings died, like in a year. And so my whole support system got wiped out and one death after another, all those horror stories you hear about. So that was traumatic too. And I went back and I to trauma therapy for that, stayed, I get my recovery, fortunately. But so trauma comes up, it's not always just childhood. But I think what that, what that gave me was a sense of mastery over some of that. And some of the stuff I spoke of earlier, the freedom to not be trapped by that story, to not be a victim of some unfortunate event in childhood, to um, really be empowered and, and um, change my self-concept. So yeah, trauma, trauma is there, I think. Um, and at the risk of uh, offending anybody, which I don't want to, um, there's this interesting thing out there in the research called post-traumatic growth, um, which is just basically for a minority of people who experience trauma, although it's traumatic, it's painful, it doesn't lighten the significance of it, it's still a, a really bad event, but some people can take that and make something good out of it, if you will. You know, they, they maybe get a, a spiritual connection or they develop a compassion for a particular community or a particular group of people, or they become empowered to you know, change careers or to do something for themselves. So, so sometimes those things can be an impetus as well. Um, so it's kind of how we frame it. Scott, if you, whatever you yeah, I'm gonna go backwards on and talk about the growth first. I'm so grateful to have been through all of the things in my life that I've been through, uh, whether they were traumas imposed upon me or, or created within myself. Um, I'm so grateful to have gone through all of that because it got me into recovery. It got me into a process of healing and I'm a much happier person now. And I think I'm a much more productive person in terms of living in the world and, and making a, you know, a positive impact instead of a negative impact. Um, because hi, Blue, how are you doing, buddy? Let's go back on the ground. Um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for all of it. Now, as far as the trauma, um, you know, like almost every addict, um, there's definite trauma in my childhood. Um, when I first got into recovery and went to therapy and my therapist said, wow, you know, when I started talking about my childhood, I said, wow, what? And he said, God, what a horrible traumatic childhood. And I said, what? You know, I didn't, it didn't occur to me that I had had trauma in my childhood, but you know, the more we dug into it, the clearer it was, um, you know, but I thought because I grew up in an upper middle class family and there was plenty of food and, you know, nobody hit me and nobody actually touched me inappropriately that I hadn't had any trauma. But in point of fact, you know, I was emotionally neglected and spiritually neglected and my sexual development was neglected. And I mean, it was a very waspy, cold, we don't talk about it environment. It's, you know, I was not allowed to have emotions. Um, you know, I, I remember I went to the doctor once when I was nine or 10 and I, I had a really high fever and the doctor said, how are you feeling? I said, I feel like crap. And I got a five minute lecture from my mother. When someone asks how you're feeling, you say, I'm well, thank you. You know, it, it, right in front of the doctor and I'm sitting here like, you know, vomiting my guts out with 103 degree fever. Um, and she's lecturing me on social etiquette um, because that was more important <laughs> than getting medical care. Um, you know, I mean, the lessons I learned were what other people think of you is far more important than what you think of you. Um, how other people think you're feeling is far more important than how you are actually feeling. Um, so, you know, 
And then my relationship with my mother, um, although not overtly incestuous, was what we call covertly incestuous. It was icky. Um, you know, she partnerized me. My father was an alcoholic and sort of absent um, emotionally, physically present, emotionally absent. Um, you know, I had an, what looked like on the surface a really good childhood, but below the surface, um, you know, I had a mother who was very unpredictable and, and clingy and overly needy and, and meshed and a father who wasn't there. And um, yeah, it was in retrospect, I mean, I'm, I'm, my face is getting hot, I'm feeling it now. Um, in retrospect, it was, you know, a neglectful and somewhat traumatic childhood. Um, and it still colors my behaviors and thoughts today. Um, not as much because I've done quite a bit of work on all of this, <laughs> but, and, you know, this is, this is typical, uh, you know, this is just a typical addict, sex addict story. Um, you know, when I talk to guys, I mean, guys, uh, all of them, God, I, I mean, David, what, I hate to say what percentage of guys, um, but of the guys we work with, what percentage have experienced either overt sexual abuse as boys or covert sexual abuse as boys. 75%? Yeah, yeah, and it's it's probably 50-50 between the two categories, I think. So, um, you know, and it's it's just, but, and, but we're boys and we're taught, you know, oh, if the babysitter touches you, that's hot, right? <laughs> that's not abuse. Well, it is abuse, um, you know, and if mom didn't actually touch you, if she only, you know, voyeured on you or whatever, well, nothing happened. You know, we're we're taught to say nothing happened as boys, um, and and I think women too to a lesser extent. But so we pretend that nothing bad ever happened to us, when in fact all of this bad stuff. And because we never process it, um, and never have anybody to talk to about it, that actually makes it worse. I mean, there's research to that effect, right? Unprocessed trauma is worse than just trauma. Yeah. yeah. Right. Clearly. Yeah. We need to move it. Not get stuck. So, yeah, I don't know. You want to add anything to that, David? Or I don't think so. I think it's just it, it's clear. I think the how it sets the people up and how it kind of traps us in. And and I think the probably one of the biggest damaging pieces we see, especially with men that we work with, is just the shame and stigma that goes with it too. I mean, just there's something there's like an extra layer of shame that um, you know I didn't do something. Um, and yeah. that's because I should have done something, but I was a kid, right? So, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a great book from Enid, by Enid Gray, E-N-O-D Gray, um, called Neglect, the Silent Abuser. Um, and, you know, we think neglect is the, the neglected kid is the little kid who's wearing dirty clothes and doesn't have lunch money. And he is, or, or she is, but there are a hundred other ways to neglect your child. Um, and, and almost all of us were neglected in some way. Um, it doesn't mean our parents were horrible parents. Um, it just means that they neglected us some aspect of our development. Um, and it probably impacted us. Um, it's definitely a book worth reading. So, um, ask us some more questions. Um, I, we've got one more here, but ask us some more because we have plenty of time today. Yeah, too, I think it's fine. Yeah. Um, addicts here, progress, not perfection, and I get that. Um, but as a betrayed partner, I seem to need perfection in order to reestablish trust and security. Um, one slip bulldozes any trust or security that has been so hard to rebuild. Uh, in fact, it seems to make it worse than before. Um, is that really even possible? Uh, thoughts on how to solve the dilemma on different needs of the couple? A great question. It, it really is. Uh, this is just perfect because we do talk about progress not perfection all the time, right? And it does kind of set up a little wiggle room it would seem for the addict in there i don't think it really is but um but i totally understand the needs of the partner as well because that well, what does a partner want a partner wants emotional safety and reassurance and consistency and you know it's the same thing that drives the partner to kind of become a detective to look for information to get that reassurance that they know everything and it's a totally you know logical conclusion and behavior to do but I, I can see where the conflict is, but i just like to say that there is, I think, a, a middle ground there that, that kind of makes it workable. So, you know, we talk about the circle plan 
where the inner circle are kind of behaviors that indicate, you know, relapse. And um, certainly those are um, deal breakers in terms of abstinence and, and sobriety accounts and all that stuff. They're, they're significant. I guess where I'm talking about maybe this might apply perhaps more is in that middle circle, right? The slippery slope stuff, the, the telling a lie or um, being late uh, when you say you'll be somewhere. Or th those kind of little things that um, should have been handled better or maybe expressing a feeling in a more timely manner, um, something like that. I think those are the issues where I see progress, not perfection, meaning, um, yeah, next time I can kind of clean up my act and do it a little better. Um, I guess if someone just actually goes out and relapses, I guess someone might say progress, not perfection as, as a way of comforting, but I think that's, a, this, that's kind of a more serious breach of the whole process to me. Um, and I think that's that costs for a much more serious study of what just happened. What's kind of what's the kind of analysis of that relapse? But I think the, the progress not perfection thing, where there's a little work for improvement, I think is I think of as more as the middle circle stuff. You know, the, the being honest or correcting um, an omission, uh, you know, right away, or um, being triggered and talking about it right away. Those, or not fast enough, you know, th that's where there could be improvement. So I think there's, it's those kind of things around the edges. I'm sure that's not a very satisfying answer as I'm hearing myself talk, but, but I think that's kind of it. I, um, I don't know, I don't know that I would actually, if somebody relapses, outright relapses, I'm not sure I would say progress not perfection. Um, and I don't wanna shame people, but I think that maybe minimizes the significance of that. Um, and Scott, I'm curious about what you, what you think. Uh, yeah, no, um, particularly with infidelity, um, an outright slip or relapse is, um, you know, is very, very different than um, a lie <laughs> about something not significant. Um, you know, in Out of the Doghouse, Dr. Rob talks about um, rigorous honesty, tell the truth and tell it faster. Um, now, the progress, not perfection with that is as an addict, uh, and I, you know, I'm a recovering sex addict, uh, I was very used to lying and covering up and keeping secrets. It was a, a deeply ingrained habit. And for the first year of my recovery, even in a 12 step meeting, I would hear something pop out of my mouth and I would ha immediately have to say, oh my God, that's not true. I, I don't know why I said that. You know, I, it would just, the lies would come out and, you know, and, I, and you know, so a lot of couples will give uh, the addict and say, okay, you know, if you tell a lie, you keep a secret, or you cover something up, you have 24 hours to come clean about it. Um, and, and the betrayed partner says, I won't get mad at you for not coming clean right away as long as you do it within the 24 hours. I can still get mad about what you did or what you covered up or whatever, but I'm not going to compound my anger with you didn't tell me right away. Um, and that's, that's kind of a progress, not perfection. I think the trade partners sometimes need to realize that the partner's not going to be perfect. Nobody's going to be perfect with the truth, you know, 24-7, 365. We all have lies slip out. And, and particularly for someone who's used to lying, um, it's a hard habit to break. Um, but as far as, yeah, going out and, and slipping or relapsing, feel free to get really angry. And even feel free to get angry about lies. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, totally. um, you know, I wanted to ask, uh, David, uh, here is one of the things that, that can be a bone of contention between couples. Um, when I'm, when I'm having somebody I'm working with do their circle plan, um, and they want to say, if I have sexual thoughts about my act, my former acting out partner, or if I'm find myself lapsing into fantasy about porn I've seen, that's an inner circle, bottom line, non-sober behavior. And my response is, no, it's not. Um, if you act on that, it's an inner circle, bottom line behavior. If you just have the thought, it's slippery, it's middle circle. It's not great, but, it's, it, but if you call your sponsor and say, Ugh, I, this thought keeps coming into my head versus actually going and you know slipping, um, it's middle circle, it's slippery. Um, and I always, and I actually advise them to say, your betrayed partner probably doesn't need to know 
that a thought crept into your head. Um, you know, that's just going to trigger her or him. Um, but sometimes, and, and here's my question, sometimes betrayed partners will insist, if you even think about acting out, I want to know. Um, and, you know, so, so the addict has somebody like me saying, oh, no, <laughs> don't. You know, if you actually do it, you have to tell, and you better tell right away. But if the thought came in and you dealt with it appropriately, you know, how do you feel about that? I think, I think we're on the same page because I think those bottom line behaviors are, first of all, they're, they're actions, right? They're activities yeah. that, that indicate a relapse. And I think what we know is that triggers, thoughts, <laughs> fantasies, they, they pop into our heads. They're, we're not really responsible, just like we're not responsible for the kind of dream we have at night, right? If things come into our heads, we have dreams, the content of which are, we have no control over. But um, what, what we are responsible as recovering addicts, when those thoughts pop up, you know, we, we can be walking down, you know, Ventura Boulevard and see a very attractive person cross the street in front of us. Okay, that we may have a brief um, thought about that person, but I, it's the responsibility of the addict not to grab onto that and hang onto that and savor it and, and play with it right in our heads, but to really kind of um, do that three second rule, do the, the kind of rehumanizing things we go through and just disconnect from it and, and manage it responsibly. But the fact that it actually comes up out of our heads or in our thoughts or crossing the street in front of us, we're not really responsible for that. We are responsible for how we manage it. And so I agree with you, the fact that somebody might have a thought or fantasy for me doesn't indicate a relapse, it indicates something they need to manage that could become a relapse. And so I think it's not a bottom line kind of behavior there. Um, and I think, again, I understand where partners are coming from. They look, they're looking for reassurance, they're looking for safety, they wanna know, um, and they want a kind of a tight ship in terms of the reporting structure here. But, but I think sometimes it's, it's actually more harmful because those things do occur. They don't mean somebody's on the road to relapse. It's a natural kind of thing. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's important to just understand. And maybe it's a matter of clarifying for the partner, what, what do we mean? You know, like you said, I think very clearly, Scott, if, if you act on that, yeah, that's a big problem. You know, that's a relapse. But, it, but the fact that it pops up, our responsibility is to process it correctly and deal with it and release it. Um, that's the appropriate response. And I don't, I don't consider that something that would be a bottom line behavior. Yeah, and even, even in our materials and Dr. Rob's book, Sex Addiction 101, the language is very clear. And, you know, bottom line, inner circle, non-sober behaviors are behaviors, not thoughts. Um, if you need to deal with thoughts, deal with them in the middle circle or the middle boundary. Um, and then the other thing that guys will put in there is lying as a bottom line behavior. And I'm all for that. But I also say lying that I don't clear up within 24 hours um, because I want that, you know, I don't want them to have to reset their, you know, sobriety clock um, because they told a white lie or, you know, she says, did you take the trash out? And he says, yes. And then he sneaks out the back and takes the trash out because he really hasn't done it yet. Uh, you know, but he needs to come clean about telling that lie. And if he doesn't come clean within 24 hours, then yeah, he might need to reset his sobriety clock. I mean, because this is, now as the addict, you think, well, that's harsh, but, and I say, no, it isn't. You are changing your behavior. Um, you know, we can't help the automatic reaction, that lie that automatically escapes. I mean, eventually we can, but we have to get better at it. What we can do is come clean about it fast. So, uh, kind of went off on that one. <laughs> so, it was a great question. Um, where are we? Um, here we are. Um, can you describe the road to relapse and typical signs that you as therapists see in your work? Um, I've heard that the drink or drug is the last step and relapse starts way before ingestions. You have, you have heard correctly, David. Yeah, totally. Um, I was just saying that today. Uh, the the you know, acting out behavior, whatever, whatever form it takes, is really the final step. And at that point, it's really way too late to intervene on oneself. But you know, we, we talk about doing kind of a, a postmortem or anatomy of relapses where we go back, see where, where they started and, and this chain of events. And it is a chain of events and thoughts and decisions and actions, but it usually starts, it can start days or weeks before the actual relapse with, you know, with an argument, with an unpleasant feeling, with um, anxiety, with um, 
you mentioned today, bills to pay, you know, whatever triggers us uh, can, can um, start to happen. Worry, anxiety, you know, big presentation, something like that. And so what do we do with that? We start to, um, we start to process that or handle that emotion and usually in an unhealthy way if we're an addict. And so we may want to escape from it or numb or distract it or um, soothe ourselves in some way. And, and remember for sex addicts, especially all different kinds of feelings and sensations and worries get kind of universally translated into a sexual urge. And so, you know, I've had clients who um, said, well, I have to have, you know, sex seven times a day. I'm just a horny guy. And well, no, you're not. You know, there's you know, every, every anxiety you have, every worry, every happy feeling, every, uh, everything gets kind of filtered into a sexual sensation. And so really kind of understanding that all these things can lead to these sexual impulses that feel sexual, but, but they're not. And, and, but it can lead to this chain of events with, um, it, it includes so many different things. It can, you know, scheduling time where nobody knows where we're at, it's setting up um, dates, looking for, you know, the, the preoccupation phase, surfing for, you know, partners or, or whatever, just this whole long chain of events that, that does finally act out. What I see a lot actually is the, the people play with it on apps. On, and when you're on those apps, um, you know, you're, the, the dopamine's flowing, you're being, you're in a preoccupied uh, state. And eventually, if you hang out on those apps long enough, you will act out. It's just inevitable. And the longer we kind of indulge in that preoccupation and that build up to the acting out, the less choice we have ultimately about, about doing it or not. But yeah, I think it's important to understand the rituals, the needs, but mostly the triggers, because very often the, the initial impetus for it is so disconnected from the event that we don't connect, we don't connect the two in that process. So it's, it's really important to take a look at. Yeah, I mean, let's say we've got a chem sex addict and he likes to binge on the weekends. Um, it's Wednesday, his boss yells at him. He knows he's getting paid on Friday. He's gonna have the money. He's gonna have the whole weekend off. So he's mad at his boss. So he spends 10 minutes, goes online to Grindr and says, oh, I could hook up with that guy. You know, the relapse has begun. It's Wednesday. He's not going to actually do anything until Friday night, but the relapse has begun with that first thought, you know, and we either nip it in the bud, we call our sponsor, we go to a meeting, we, you know, call a friend and say, oh my God, I'm so triggered right now. Help me, help me walk through this. Or we play with the thought and, and go into the fantasy and, you know, two days later, three days later, we act out. So... <laughs> Um, when I was 16, I hooked up with someone 25. Uh, she was just looking for fun. I think this is from a male <coughs> and thought I was great at the time. But looking back, it was probably another part of my dysfunctional way of learning about sex. Uh, is there a difference in how a young male would process that situation than a young female in the same situation? Interesting question. Wow, interesting. Um, great questions to me. So I think one of the things, this, this um, gets at a couple of things. One is the whole difference between sex roles, right? Sometimes uh, if the uh, abuser or aggressor is a, a woman, um, that's considered uh, in a different light than if it was a, if the roles were reversed, if it was a 25 year old man and a 16 year old girl, that would be, um, I think more scandalous. Somehow it's more acceptable the other way around. I will tell you from a psychological point of view, both are equally damaging in terms of kind of hijacking that arousal template and, and resetting uh, some bad patterns. So I think, yeah, totally there's a dysfunctional way. Um, I think young men tend to sort of think that's really cool, that's great and, and uh, get, get approval for it when I think actually it's, there's a lot of sort of self-deception there that there's actually more harm than good with that kind of thing. Um, any young person, that is, uh, has sex willingly or not, you know, with consent or not, um, it, it, there's a damaging effect in that they start to become overly sexualized, meaning their identity starts to become sexualized. And young men have that more often than women anyway, uh, seeing themselves in kind of sexual terms and uh, sexual conquests and all that stuff. But I think um, when, when we have sex maybe too soon, especially and there's a certain element of exploitation and control, I think, here. Um, it damages this damage. And it, it, sometimes people talk about this as one of those victimless uh, kind of crimes. But I would propose that um, 
there's some bad lessons that have been learned about sex and identity and control and relations and, and all kinds of things. There. So I'd be very cautious about it. I think unfortunately, just because of our culture, it is processed differently in that um, it's you know considered a success maybe for a young man and that where the young woman would be stigmatized and chastised. So very different approaches. Yeah, and just from a psychological standpoint, I mean, some 16 year olds are pretty mature, both physically and emotionally, and some 16 year olds are not. Um, so, you know, that could impact it. And uh, yeah, there's just a whole lot to unpack there. Um, okay, I've known a number of gay men that have previously lived in heterosexual marriages and wonder what it is, what it is like for a gay man to have heterosexual sex. Um, I'm straight and can't imagine gay sex being pleasurable, and I'm not even sure I could perform in that setting. Wouldn't a gay man find heterosexual sex similarly difficult or even repulsive? David? Wow. So um, yesterday, I happened to sit on another group of former um, Seeking Integrity alumni uh, who have found each other. Uh, and there's a, there's a small group of guys who are heterosexual men who have had, in some cases over periods of years, sex with other men. So they're married with two women, have occasional sex with men as sometimes part of their sex addiction, sometimes actually not. And so they're, they're kind of trying to figure out what is going on here. And I think what my conclusion is basically is that we have this kind of false choice between male and female and heterosexual and homosexual, there's much more of a continuum that, that goes on. And I think, you know, in some cases, unfortunately, that's driven by trauma and trauma repetition and things like that. I don't think that's the majority of the cases. I think sometimes people just have these attractions. And in other cases, by the way, there can be a minority of men who, uh, because of escalation of addiction and the need for dopamine and, you know, as things that are exotic or unusual in terms of sexual tastes can find themselves having sex with all kinds of different kinds of people than they normally would. But I think in this case, people are just on a different spectrum. I think um, most gay men probably uh, would have difficult, difficulty thinking about having sex with a woman and, and probably most straight men would feel the same way about sex with another man. But um, it's all, I think I've, what I've concluded is that there's no easy answer on this. I think if there's so many individual variations and that people are so variable that um, I'm still trying to figure out what's going on here. But, but I think it's a lot of, variability on that spectrum. Yeah, I mean, you know, in my experience talking to people, very few men, men in particular, are completely 100% heterosexual or completely 100% gay. They're usually somewhere in that spectrum in the middle. I mean, you know, they might be 98% gay, but, uh, you know, or they might be 60 or, or you know, um, and if you're even close, um, you know, it's easier, particularly for men of a certain age, it was really much easier to just get married and do what you were supposed to do than to try to live as an openly gay man, um, which I think is why a lot of people did that. Um, so uh, I don't know that it's going to be as common moving forward where, where it's much more acceptable to be gay now than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, but interesting question. Okay, with all the trauma, neglect, and abuse most addicts have gone through, I still don't understand why they, uh, meaning addicts, can't be cured um, with all the love and attention that most of us spouses give them. Because so far in my experience in groups of betrayed partners, all of them are amazing, loving, courageous women that have given all for their partners and marriages. Um, that's why it hurts so much. Um, why all that love was not enough to compensate and heal them uh, from the trauma. So why isn't you know having a loving partner enough? Great question, by the way. It's a beautiful question. And it's a true, I think, mystery to a lot of people. You know, earlier in this hour, we talked about somebody being able to receive a compliment or positive feedback from someone, but having trouble with it because it didn't match the insides. And I think if we have somebody who's all the healthy, loving in the world, if we don't love ourselves, in fact, if we really dislike ourselves, as most addicts do, if we feel are undeserving, remember the, those lists I read at the beginning, if you were here, the, you know, I'm unlovable, I'm hopeless, I'm alone, I'm a bad person. These are, these are the everyday realities of a lot of addicts. And if those kind of thoughts are bouncing around inside us, we can have all the positive affirmation in the world, 
but it doesn't, it's not enough because it doesn't ring true. And I think being able to receive that takes a process of starting to believe it about ourselves and how self-compassion and, and make it work. So I, I understand the pain there, but, but I think it's just, it's not enough. It, it's, it's a beautiful thing, but if the addict isn't able to really understand it and hear it and accept it, um, it's going to be problematic. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, I like to ask guys um, who had affairs about the affair partners. Was she as pretty as your wife? Oh God, no. Was she as interesting? No. Was she as smart? No. Was she as funny? No. Was she as anything as your wife? No. I love my wife. My wife is hot. My wife is great. You know, and you know, the takeaway from that is it's, it's not about the wife. Um, it's about the addict needing to escape because he's <clears throat> shame driven. Shame is the master emotion for most addicts, especially sex addicts. And, you know, just getting that outside validation will take us out of our shame for a little while. And, you know, the reason why we can't accept that outside validation from a, a loving partner um, it's because it, we have to be too vulnerable to accept that. You're the one we love and care about. You're the one who can hurt us the most. We go after somebody who can't hurt us to get that validation because it's safer. That's how shame-driven and afraid we are. Um, it's not you. It's us. <laughs> Just it's, it's not you, betrayed partners. It's us. Um, so I don't know if that helps you at all, but but um, yeah, nothing wrong with you. Yeah. We're the addict. We're the one with shame and, and fear and, and trauma. And, and you scare us. As much as we want you to love us, you scare us. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you want to take one more, David? Yeah. Okay. You take the, the chat just because I know that person who's been there a long time. About yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, um, this person says, um, I'm considering a lot. I got offered a job offer today, considering a lateral move. I'm considering, but I'm hesitant because I'm doing well and feeling well, worried about um, taking on the stress of upsetting the apple cart. Um, I feel like I need to put my sobriety first and not um, jeopardize what I've got. You know, this is a really huge um, topic, and I, I totally get this because I think sometimes when things go well, especially if there's been a period when things aren't, haven't gone well, uh, and we have that kind of formula that's working right now, um, I think it's, it's best to be conservative, frankly, especially in the early days of, of uh, recovery. Now, obviously jobs, we, we all need to work and eat and all that, so you gotta consider that, but it sounds like that's not the situation here. So I'd be really cautious about it. What I would do is follow a process. I would really consult with, with other people that, that know you, sort of your support group and get some feedback. This is the kind of decision-making process I think that really is really benefits from uh, several different thinkers that, that give you the opinion. But I think my impulse, if it were me, I think I'd sit tight um, um, unless I felt really strong about my recovery. Yeah, now there, if there's no reason to leave the current job, I was talking to somebody the other day in a consult and he was a nurse and he had access to all kinds of drugs because he was a nurse in the ER and it was feeding his addiction and he wanted to know if he should get a different job. Uh, you know, in early sobriety, like, yeah, you probably should. First of all, ER nurse, very stressful and hey, free drugs right there. Um, and you are gonna get in trouble, you know, sooner rather than later, you need to get out of that environment. But I don't know, you know, this sounds like it's a very different environment. Um, so there can be reasons to make a big change early, but generally it's, status quo is good uh, until you figure out where you are and get some sobriety under your belt and are ready to handle changes. So, um, I'm sorry, everybody, we're not going to get to all the questions today, um, but save them for next week. We'll be back uh, next Wednesday uh, every week. Um, David, anything you want to say to take us out? Uh, no, just remember the gifts of sobriety and recovery. Uh, a lot of freedom of, of uh, recapturing our lives. And I also want to just thank everybody for the really thoughtful questions. Yeah, great, great questions tonight. And if you have not seen the movie Pleasantville, please watch it. I love this movie. <laughs> so, all right, yeah. have a good night, everybody. Nice. <laughs>